Thank you, and I do want to thank the patient safety movement and really my friend Joe Chiani, especially for your leadership and persistence. Uh, it has been ex really inspiring to, for us to work with you on so many efforts. You've been a real presence in Washington, and that has made a difference. So uh, w since we sit in Washington as well, our headquarters are there, we have been very happy to see um, such fighters along our side as we all uh, are really working on this incredibly important issue. Um, so one of the ways that LeapFrog has been very active around patient safety uh, has been as part of this coalition that is developing uh, the concept for a national patient safety board and advocating to have it put in place. Um, we've been part of that for, I think it's three years. It was prior to COVID actually that we started getting involved with it. Um, the, uh, um, the Jewish Foundation really was the, the lead spark that got this moving and just truly a leader in this area. And we'll, we'll talk to Robert in a, in a minute about that. But we felt very strongly at LeapFrog um, that on behalf of our purchaser members who are employers who purchase health benefits for their employees, founded LeapFrog, uh, that we had to be more effective at identifying this problem as a national priority. That without that spotlight of a national priority, we felt like we just can't get the traction. Because every person that you talk to, and, and so in, among employers, employers are usually lay people. They are themselves not in the healthcare system. They learn about these problems through their employees or through their own experience as family members. <coughs> And when you talk to them, they'll say, yeah, I have heard a lot of these complaints or problems or issues, but they always think it's just them. They always think, oh, yeah, oh, my uncle, he had a terrible infection or something happened. You can't believe it. It was just terrible. I'm like, I can believe it. I hear this from every single person, literally, that I talk to has a story to tell. And that's because, and then we lay out the statistics, which we've talked about today, that are so disturbing. One in four people harmed uh, when they are admitted to a hospital, that is an astronomical figure that is unacceptable on any level, but shocking to people even when they've experienced harm. They just don't understand that this is so ubiquitous. And so from the perspective of purchasers and for the public at large, uh, who are their employees often, um, they really want to have the sense, they need to have that, um, momentum behind them that this is important not just to us and our employees, that this is important to the whole country, that we all have to come together. They need that sense of um, national unity around this problem. And so we got very excited about the idea of a National Patient Safety Board to bring that spotlight, bring that sense of unity, and also to tell every individual who, is consider, who considers this a problem in their own life that you're not alone. That we get it. This is a priority to us. What happened to you is a priority to us. So uh, that to us is the number one reason to have this, no matter what it says. No matter what this board does, that's the number one reason just to have it. Third leading cause of death in the United States ought to have one spotlight, one focus federally so we make sure we're accountable for answers. Um, I, I will say that just to add one piece to this that's been really interesting to us, a couple of things. One is technology. I think this board and the concept behind it has taken on some very interesting uh, questions about how we use technology for patient safety. When we implemented EMRs a few years ago, there was no consideration of patient safety. It was just like, get them out there, let's get them used, and it's sort of assume that it's all gonna come together for patients, which frankly, it did not. And now we're going back and saying, oh geez, we should have thought of patient safety when we did this and how it was gonna help for that. Well, this board needs to make sure that happens with the new advances in technology. And I think there's been some very interesting conversations about how this board can be helpful. Again, the spotlight alone can have a huge galvanizing impact on that question. Um, and then we've also thought and believe strongly that um, patients need to be at the center. And so this board, the structure of it, the, uh, the, everything about it has been putting patients at the center, but also giving patients a voice so they can tell their story. I mean, you've heard these incredible stories today and uh, Steve Burrows, you'll, if you go to the movie tonight, which I strongly recommend, um, the story in Bleed Out is so powerful and had such an impact. Those stories have impact, but also those stories tell us, give us extraordinary expertise into what the real problem is. 
Because when you hear a patient's story, you're understanding the full range of issues that occurred that created a problem for that patient. You're seeing them in a unified way, in a coordinated way that you don't get from just one perspective of one provider, let's say, who's in the mix. They, they might see it from one perspective. The patient sees the whole perspective. And that is why it's so critical that we put patients in the middle and we listen to the stories and we are, uh, we are motivated by those stories. That's what makes the real change happen. So we're excited about that. And then we're, uh, we're excited as well about the spotlight. We're maybe not as excited about the transparency that's involved in this. We're, we're huge advocates of transparency. LeapFrog uh, issues letter grades to every hospital in the country. We publicly report by hospital on what those are. And it's, uh, you know, it can be difficult to be that transparent. It's been very effective, but it's, tri <coughs> it's, it's tough. Um, but this board doesn't need to do that. This board isn't, tr isn't trying to do letter grades on every hospital, and they're not trying to call out performance on every single thing. We have others that can do that, including LeapFrog. CMS has done a great job of that. But what this does, again, is that, that spotlight, because nothing else can happen. We just can't get the momentum without that spotlight. So the first priority for us is the spotlight, and then we want to see where we can go from there. And there are many flowers that need to bloom before we're going to solve this problem. So with that, let, let me start with, um, with Robert. Why don't you tell us, you've been really, yourself, personally a real leader in this, brought together so many folks in Washington and then uh, across the country. Tell us about, um, tell us about what's, what are the key elements of the board and, and where do you think it's going? Is it going to happen? Yeah, so the National uh, Patient Safety Board was uh, designed around one main goal, and that's to uh, prevent harm from occurring in healthcare organizations. And I have to say, uh, Dr. Uh, Berwick's executive order uh, described it uh, very well. <laughs> uh, but just to go into some additional uh, detail, I uh, think of the National Patient Safety uh, uh, Board as a public-private research and a development uh, team that is uh, waking up every morning uh, focused on th three main functions uh, to uh, achieve that goal. And the first function being to um, aggregate all the available data across the public and uh, private sector uh, partners to be able to identify and anticipate um, injury and harm in healthcare at the national level. In, not, in other words, having this body be a national a learning system uh, to uh, prevent harm. And in addition to identifying injury and harm, Anticipating it is where AI comes into play. Uh, that's where a technology can be really helpful in terms of getting the right information to frontline care teams to take a preventative um, action. The first function in terms of being able to uh, measure and anticipate injury and harm would also be looking at all of the reports that uh, patients, staffs, and uh, providers and families would be able to submit uh, to the National Patient Safety Board to feed into their large uh, 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 data set. The second function of the uh, National Patient Safety Board is then to um, understand the contextual factors, the precursors, and the causes of injury and harm, especially in response to abnormal patterns of injury and harm and reoccurring harm events. Then that leads into the third function, that in response to those causes, this public-private healthcare safety team would also be charged with identifying and gaining consensus on what are the solutions that need to be adopted by those partners to actually prevent that harm from occurring. And by solutions, we are anticipating that this team would come up with ways in terms of how can uh, devices, uh, technologies uh, be standardized um, across um, healthcare organizations so that, for example, a nurse doesn't have to learn how different oxygen tanks and uh, defibrillators work in different hospitals. There should be standards across the place. And we also think it's very important to use a human factors engineering lens, which helps to understand how do those who actually use these uh, devices and technologies in a work setting interact with those uh, devices. And human factors engineers are excellent at seeing so-called uh, crash buttons. Um, and those 
crash buttons that are all too common in healthcare uh, need to be removed so that uh, providers um, can focus on patient care uh, versus uh, 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 being focused on doing a constant of workarounds to keep uh, patients uh, safe. And these new solutions are really important, especially in the context of the current workforce crisis. Uh, we can't um, expect um, hospitals that are facing 30% vacancy rates uh, with a frustrated, burned out staff to um, ask their teams to follow more manual steps. Uh, we I need to rethink in terms of how to reconfigure their a work environment to enable all uh, providers and staff to uh, provide safe and optimal care every time. And as Leah he alluded to, uh, patients would be involved in this, uh, both as a member of that public-private healthcare safety team, uh, they would also be on the actual, bo actual board of that uh, public-private healthcare safety team. And a key function of the board uh, would be to have sole authority in terms of approving the recommendations and reports that would come out of that R&D uh, team to uh, mitigate any uh, political um, interference um, and, and influences. And in terms of the, uh, in terms of the uh, policy prospects, uh, we are currently uh, working with a Republican and Democrat sponsor in the House to introduce an updated version of the NPSB bill that was introduced last year uh, by Representative uh, Berrigan. And then we all have also lined up um, R&D sponsors in the Senate who would then um, introduce a companion bill uh, since they would like the House to do that upfront lift. <laughs> and then I'm um, a special thanks um, also to Joe Kiani and the work at PCAS because they have um, it's opened up the policy window to even consider that an executive order is even uh, possible. And so we also have an executive order strategy that's been uh, drafted as well. And that strategy is very much connected to the uh, work of a PCAS and essentially uh, we will be uh, mobilizing the NPSB a coalition that's now grown to over 80 organizations to uh, put uh, pressure on creating an executive order to um, act on those recommendations from the PCAST report. And yes, I um, completely agree that let's also just uh, copy and paste uh, Dr. Burrick's executive order and, and yeah. get it, it to the president um, as soon as possible. Thank you. <laughs> So, uh, Sue Sheridan, uh, you, you've been an articulate uh, advocate for the patient perspective. Activist. I'm, you're right. I'm sorry. She talked yeah. about that, and I, I forgot. <laughs> Activist for, for patients and families, and really by telling your own story. So, uh, with, with such courage, because it takes a lot of courage, actually, for patients and families to repeatedly tell these stories that are so... Um, personally devastating and to tell it over and over it's is is incredible courage and sacrifice for you to do that and you've made a real difference by doing so so i i salute you for that thank you and you've also had a big big uh, impact on this uh, on the concept really of the uh, the national patient safety board so uh, tell us what what you're thinking sure is. yeah and first of all um Thank you, Leah. And, um, and, and when I use the term activist, I want to I wanna <laughs> invite everybody to think about this, because there's this lovely concept of positive activism, where we use our energy of differences to promote and motivate and change. And so I say, when I say activist, I say it with you know, positivity, and I invite everybody else, because like I said earlier, advocates talk about it, activists do it. And so that's why I, I'm going to be, you know, insistent that we're all called activists. Um, in terms of the National Patient Safety Board, um, I personally support it and Patients for Patient Safety US supports the concept. And we've been in it from the beginning, um, really trying to learn about it and, and make sense of it. And where, how does it really impact us? And first I wanna support it in terms of the threats that I gave this morning. You know, number one threat, there's no one in charge. Well, this gives, patient safety a federal home. It signals that this is a priority in our country. We need that. Um, the second threat that it, that it addresses is the, um, this assumption that the healthcare system can fix itself. Well, we, 
that concerns the patient community because we think we should be up the table. And like Robert said, two of the five board directors will be patients or family members who have experienced harm, who have a track record in improving safety. Um, the other threat that it, you know, it, it, it basically addresses all the threats that I said this morning. Now, personally, in terms of, you know, we had at the coalition kind of a, a use case that we use my son, Cal, um, that probably many of you know that Cal suffered brain damage from his newborn jaundice in 1995, something that is completely preventable. It was because they used visual assessment. Um, young doctors and nurses didn't know really the dangers of jaundice because they were young. Um, there was early discharge. So it was a really perfect storm when, when Cal fell through all the cracks. Um, we actually watched him suffer brain damage in the hospital. He, he lived through that experience. He's 28 now. Um, severe cerebral palsy, hearing impaired, speech impaired, mobility impaired. Um, funny, he was, he was going to come with me today, but um, he actually has some stand-up comedy that he's performing tonight. So he's not with us. Um, but but in, in thinking about what happened to Cal, you know, this was 1995. It took a long time to get Cal properly diagnosed. And when he was diagnosed by a team of, of specialists at a university in the United States, they said Cal was the only case of cornicarus in the United States, cornicarus brain damage from jaundice, which was really eradicated in the developed, developed countries in like the 1970s. So they had not seen a case of, of cornicarus in the United States. It really happens more in um, developing countries, um, Africa, Eastern Mediterranean region, Southeast Asia. So Cal was really a, a, an anomaly. And then I had the opportunity to testify at HRQ in 2000 and um, where I met Sir Liam, and um, there was a front page article of Cal on USA Today. And I was inundated by phone calls from parents that day saying they had a baby just like Cal, that that baby had connectors. And so the moms, you know, we all got together, we connected the tots. No one was collecting this data. We were thinking Cal was the only baby in the United States. And then, then I connected with researchers who had been creating a registry for research where they had 125 cases of cornicarus in the last eight years. This data was flying under the radar. It was flying under the radar. It was packaged and buried in many confidentiality clauses where people couldn't talk about it. But to know that had those cases come forward and had that data been collected like by an NPSB, I think Cal would probably be okay today. Well, he is okay today. He probably wouldn't be dealing with his disabilities today. And so it really made me think about our healthcare system and our data. And to this day, I don't think Kernicterus gets captured anywhere. And, and I've spoken to other patients here. We just don't think, our, we're harmed, there's data, and it just kind of goes somewhere, but it, it's not going to where it should be. And so, you know, what the moms did of the children with cornicterus is, um, given there was no NPSB, um, we created our own NPSB. And so what we moms did is we reached out to the healthcare system, the very healthcare system that harmed our kids. We reached out to the Joint Commission, CMS, um, CDC, HRQ, ASPE, the American Academy of Pediatrics, nursing organizations, I'm forgetting some names, but all of those stakeholders came to a workshop that we moms hosted. And so we said to this whole system, this is, you know, the whole industry system on newborn safety, we said, we've got a problem, we got to, here is our data. So we provided the data. We handed over the hard copies of their birthing records, and so they, we worked together, and then we collectively came up with a solution. So it, over a period of time, the Joint Commission is, issued Sentinel event alerts. Leapfrog, thank you, uh, adopted that in your survey. Um, CDC announced it as an emerging public health issue. Um, the AAP eventually called for a universal Billy Rubin test for all babies, and that's why our babies were being harmed. So we kind of created our own group to do what I think the NPSB would do. So when we did this use case, you know, it, it, it really seemed that an NPSB could have caught that data early on and elevated such a rare but harmful and, and awful condition that you would have sounded the alarm. Absolutely, and, and you did have a, a huge impact on that. Although my child, 10 years after yours was born, had uh, a near miss. They, they almost, right. they did not do the test, and 
So uh, you educated me on the fact that this, my child is not the only one. Here we go again, right? Everybody yeah. thinks we're the only one. Um, Sir Liam Donaldson, uh, I'd like to talk with you. You have some actual experience to tell us um, because you've implemented something like this in the UK. So what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? Any advice? And how's it going? Well, the very first um, incident report I received was in 1987. I was a young regional medical officer working in the northeast of England, and local hospital manager rang me to say a patient had died in his hospital during surgery. Uh, he'd been given a bladder washout as part of the procedure, and the long, wrong solution was given, and that killed him. So actually an error that could still occur today. But the um, important thing about the call was this was not a call to alert me to a patient safety incident. The term wasn't even used in those days. Um, it was because he was um, wanted to advise me that there might be bad publicity for the NHS and um, just so that I could be aware. If I read something in the newspaper, this was what it was about. And he used a phrase that um, the Brits in the audience will recognize and not everybody else will. Uh, he said, oh, well, don't worry. It'll be tomorrow, uh, tomorrow's, uh, yesterday's fish and chip paper. And basically, in the old days, fish and chips was served in a bundle of newspaper. And when you wanted to say, well, there'll be a, a bad story in the media, but it'll quickly disappear, you said that. And I said to him, well, a patient died. What are we going to do about it? Anyway, <clears throat> I tried over time over the next few years to raise concerns with uh, leaders of the National Health Service. And they were really, it wasn't that they weren't interested, they were bemused. They didn't see any connection between the different incidents that were occurring. So I reached out beyond the healthcare system to people like James Reason, um, Charles Vincent, Rona Flynn, who was doing research in uh, the oil fields in, in Aberdeen, and uh, Ken Smart, who was the safety officer for British Airways. So that when I became chief medical officer 12 years later, I was able to um, have enough knowledge to set up a patient safety program in the NHS. And one of the first things we did was to set up a national agency, the National Patient Safety Agency. Um, eventually, it was abolished, wrongly in my view, I think, because the government was trying to... Um, reduce bureaucracy, but essentially it had a mixed track record. But the most important thing that I would say for you doing something similar, setting up a national body, is to determine what its positioning should be in relation to the change that's required in patient safety. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about um, strategic change in a population level to try and make care safer. And I haven't changed over those 36 years my basic uh, diagnosis of the things that need to change, but they prove very, very intractable. So for example, mainstreaming patient safety in the culture of the NHS, it's still a bit of a silo, and it's remained like that for over 30 years. Nothing can really, um, no transformative change can occur until it's mainstreamed. Learning, um, relatively weak still. We have plenty of data, we have a lot of insights, but we're not, we're not picking up and learning from it. Solutions, the very few evidence-based solutions. Uh, having an independent voice, accountability, patients and families. These are big thematic issues. Uh, we can deal with some of the technical things and make improvements in patient safety, but until we start to become transformative to those things, then um, we won't change at all. So I would just point out to you something that you're all very well aware of. Patient safety, attempts to improve patient safety are occurring in a complex adaptive system. And much though the politicians won't like this, the only way to achieve change in a complex adaptive system is by a learning approach. It isn't by issuing instructions, guidelines, directions, that will have relatively little impact. So think very, very carefully if you're setting up this agency, this new board, don't just list the functions, learning, data, analysis, 
look to see how in a complex adaptive system it can be an agent for change. What mechanisms will it use? What powers will it have? How will it be accountable? All of those things. And I think if you do that, you've got a chance of a real breakthrough. But if you ignore it and just by rote almost list the functions that need to be addressed and allocate them and leave it to get on with it, you won't achieve a great deal. Thank you. That is extremely helpful. Thank you. So now we have Professor Naj Mishkadi, who has really great experience to tell us from other industries, which is something I love about this conference, is that we do have these examples from other industries and really uh, significant leaders uh, who have uh, who've really been there and done that, who've done what we're trying to do. So, so what's your, what's, what is your wisdom and advice for us? Thank you, Leah. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here when I see it, my fine panelists and as an engineer, I feel like a bull in a china shop, all these <laughs> nice people with medical background, doctors and that. I'm a simple, very, very uh, unsophisticated engineer. My uh, research for the last uh, 34, 40 years have been in the area of human factors and safety culture of uh, safety critical systems. By safety critical system, I mean those systems, when something goes wrong, it harms the people, the passenger, the patient, or bystanders. And the industries that have been working with the safety critical system has been primarily nuclear power industry. I have been, as the Honorable Chris Hart mentioned, to Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, Fukushima Daini, Fukushima Daiichi, that's a there are other creatures, they don't go there. I've been to uh, deep water drilling accidents, refinery accidents, and others. One thing that I learned, which is very related to this discussion here of National Patient Safety Board, is as was mentioned earlier many times, Dr. Durkin mentioned that, Dr. Ramsey mentioned that, Dr. Bervik mentioned that, is the issue of learning and information sharing. I think one of the best and biggest contribution of National Transportation Safety Board that, as you may well know, investigates accident in five modes of transportation. And it's independent federal safety investigative agency, meaning it's independent from DOT. It investigates aviation accident, maritime accident, railroad accident, surface accident, and number five is the most elusive one, pipeline. And they issue reports, independent report, and then they have something which is called the most wanted list. That they put the lessons from this accident investigation in a cumulative way and they carry that every year. Mm -hmm. This is one of the best way of information sharing. I have been on both sides of that. I use some of NTSB reports, like the Vamata uh, the accident at Fort Totten, in my courses at USC. And there is a similar agency called Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board. That's again another independent federal safety investigation agency that they investigate accidents and they issue report interdisciplinary investigation of refinery petrochemical accident. For with CSP, I work as their advisor, or they call that experts in human factors and safety culture. By the way, it was a music to my ear, Robert, to see National Patient Safety Board that you explicitly mentioned human factors several times. Yeah. Kudos to you. And kudos to Honorable Chris Hart also for mentioning that. Yeah. Human factors, I think, is one of the most important contributing factors to many accidents. As I have looked at this issue of the uh, design-induced error. If we want to stop error, we need to look at this design stage. And there is another independent safety agency which is called Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board, that they are independent from the Department of Energy, but they have jurisdiction over the nuclear weapon laboratory. These three independent federal agency, I think they have been role models for us. They issue report, they try to, as 
Mr. Hart mentioned, to help us to learn from error and near misses, to disseminate data, and help the industry learn. For example, I work with US Chemical Safety Board at the accident investigation of the BP refinery explosion of 2005 in Texas City. That report, which is considered to be a similar report, has been used by other refineries in order to learn lesson. I've been told that by my students that they work at the Exxon refinery, that they use that report. I've been told that by another refinery that work at another refinery in, uh, in the state of Washington. I think this is the beauty of this uh, National Patient Safety Board is uh, to disseminate information. I am sitting on the board of the Joint Commission and I've been pushing our colleagues on the board of and on the Joint Commission also to join this movement. I have been pushing for you, I'm an unpaid promoter of you, getting the Human Factors and Ergonomic Society to, to support you. I think this is a must need have. Now I have to tell you something, Dr. Don Bervik. Your talk this morning changed the last part of my comments. Because of your talk and because of Mr. Joe Kiani's talk, I went up and I picked up this piece that I had in my briefcase. This is a New York Times letter to editor section from 1990, 33 years ago, January 1990. There is a very nice letter by a very distinguished gentleman who was US Senator from Delaware, Joseph Biden, mm. pushing for creating an independent nuclear safety board. Then Senator Biden did not believe that a regulatory agency, which is the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission, can do a good job on doing accident and incident investigation of nuclear power industry. That's why he wrote this letter to the editor of New York Times. On December 12, 1989, it got published two weeks later. Senator Biden at that time was pushing for creation of independent safety board. He came up with a legislation, a bill, which based on my memory, he introduced that bill in 1986, 1987, 1988, and then because it didn't pass, he reintroduced that in 1989, 1991, 1994, and finally gave up. This poor soul, yours truly had a letter to editor in the same issue, which is published side by side. This is my claim to fame. We basically said the same thing. We need this independent nuclear safety board. In that case, Dr. Bervik, Mr. Kiani, you have an advocate here from 34 years ago in the White House. <laughs> he doesn't relent. He will push for it. And the only thing that we need to do is to get him reelected to finish off the job. <laughs> I, I appreciate that comment, but I have to say, patient safety is a nonpartisan issue. This is yeah. one issue, right? right? Okay. And I'm unregistered voter. <laughs> I'm not committed, but I'm registered, but I'm not partisan. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, our final uh, panelist that I want to hear from is um, Abby Tofik. You have a very interesting perspective. In addition to a tragic story in your own life that you can you may choose to speak about, but uh, uh, and and your courage, just like Sue's courage, in really speaking and stepping forward to tell that story. In addition, you're a provider, and that has uh, that experience is a new lens for you in your own work as a provider. I think you have some very interesting insights for us as we think about this board on how, um, how we might bring the healthcare system to, to see their patients uh, through this new lens as well. So tell us what you think, Abby. Thank you. I would like to first um, express my gratitude to Joe and Sarah and the Patient Safety Movement Foundation for giving me the privilege to be here. Um, when I chose to be part of this movement it was mostly because I just didn't want my brother's loss to just be that, just a loss, or a loss statistic. Um, I wanted to be a stepping stone towards creating a change and preventing others from going through the same pain. And I 
truly believe that errors should be looked at as an opportunity to create change, but a change that it's a constructive change that is implemented and enforced by an entity that believes in the truth, in the transparency and accountability and teamwork. Otherwise, we're just all individuals or entities or, or victims and, and um, organizations that are um, isolated and scattered um, and just cries in a chaos. And we're only going to be facing a history of repeat and repeat of history. I think Sue so brilliantly explained uh, the importance of having such an entity in the last panel and today. Uh, but as a um, healthcare provider, I also truly believe that um, empowering patients is so important in this movement because I believe that patient safety is a partnership. It's a partnership between all of us who provide the care and all of us who will receive the care one way or another, um, either currently or in the future. And I've seen it time and again in my patients who are so lost because they don't know anything about what safety is all about. We all go to school and get educated about how to become successful, um, but we never go to a school or there's no entity teaching us how to be educated and how to be safe. And it's um, devastating when I hear my patients who are only realizing what they didn't know after they became victims. And I think such an entity can also play a very important role in empowering everyone in the community about how to be a safe patient, how to make the right decisions, how to pick which hospital they want to have a procedure with based upon whether or not these are safe hospitals, they, these are accountable hospitals, people um, who are patients are, you know, only talk about the issues that happened to them were mistakes only after the fact. And I think it's very important to create proactive people, proactive patients who believe in prevention as well. Thank you. Of course. So we only have three minutes left, but I, I have very much been grateful for for the wisdom from this panel. This has been extraordinary. Uh, so I'm going to ask one question uh, for all of you to think about and answer, uh, which is we are talking about the National Patient Safety Board, but we want to build a sailboat. What's the wind? What is going to move it? How is it? What's going to give it momentum going forward? Uh, because I think it's very important to recognize with patient safety, uh, we know a lot about how to, how to fix the problem. We just don't do it enough. What, what galvanizes change? What makes that difference? And um, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll start with an answer to give you a chance to think about it, uh, which is, uh, for me, it is, um, it's that spotlight, I go back to that. It's really shining a light on the issue uh, on a national level, and the spotlight is galvanizing. It, it changes the way we think about the importance of our own work on a day-to-day -day basis as providers, or as patients, as in whatever role we play in the healthcare system, and we all have a role, every one of us, uh, it reminds us that, that there's, a, there's a mission behind it, there's a reason, and, and it's important. So I, that's my feeling about, that's the wind that's gonna make this sailboat across the ocean. Can I start? Yes, you may, <laughs> Sir Liam. One of my other uh, pro bono roles with WHO is I chair the Polio Eradication Board. Mm. I would say the way we would galvanize um, patient safety is to show that we can eradicate something big. If we could show that we could eradicate sepsis, not just lower its incident, but completely eradicate it, we'd galvanize such unified commitment that I think it would show that it's worth making a commitment to patient safety in many other areas as well. Thank you. We need wins. That's a, that's a great one. Sue? Okay, you know what my answer is, but um, I, I think, and, and Liam, I'm going to quote the, the Global Patient Safety Action Plan that says, perhaps the most powerful tool in patient safety is patient family engagement. And I want to add to that, I want to add that, you know, we, we've kind of talked about um, the force and the wind in the, in the sails of our healthcare system. 
really the power of the patients and families, civil society, patient groups, disease-based groups, population-based groups that really have no aggregate voice right now, and that's what Patients for Patient Safety US is trying to do, and that you know this really needs, because we are the ones that experience the bad outcomes, and we need to get together and find the avenues and work with our government, and, and fortunately our government is opening doors to patients and patient groups now, to really move this, to push this, to, to be the force to push this into reality. That's a great I answer. That. Abby? Involve the patients, involve the future victims, involve basically everyone. You know, we'll, I mean, Dr. Uh, Ramsey constantly reminds us that we're all going to be patients one day. So that means everybody. It means the society. It means remembering that you know, without the society, you can't really, you know, participation of the society, you can't really create any change. Robert? And I think one advocacy, there's a power in numbers. Uh, you can get involved and join the uh, coalition by going to www.npsb.org. And we also have a, a platform to write a letter to your representative uh, to ask them to reintroduce the N uh, uh, PSP bill. And also, as soon as you see the PCAST, the patient safety recommendations, likely in August, uh, write to the president, uh, tell your story as a, a provider, researcher, patient, and say, you want the president to do, do an executive order to accept, to accept the PCAST uh, patient safety recommendations. And then secondly, um, the um, healthcare industry, um, of course, has um, influence as well. And I think that there's a chance that they will get involved in this advocacy as well because of the workforce crisis. Uh, they need new solutions to uh, design a, a work environment to allow all uh, uh, pay, to allow all staff and uh, providers to achieve safe, optimal care. And I think uh, that is helping to e e elevate the urgency around uh, patient safety. Absolutely. Professor? I think the stars are lined up for patient safety. President Biden being in the White House with his advocacy, activism, an interest in patient safety. Mr. Joe Kiani being in PCAST and PCAST having, Dr. Prono was in that, they are advocating for patient safety. And also I see the Joint Commission under the leadership of the, Dr. John Perlin, they are very interested in that. IHI, thanks to the creation of uh, Dr. Berwick, they are interested. I think the stars are lined up and people, the patients, people like me who are researchers, we are fed up of seeing all of these preventable medical errors. I think we have a very special, unique window of opportunity between now and next four years. Being honest with you, I think if Mr. Biden doesn't do that, no other president will have the guts to do that. Well, that is a powerful way to conclude our panel, but 